So, you want to work in a zoo? Well, you're in the right place. We're going to be talking to zookeepers, researchers, conservationists and many more people about their careers. We will discuss how they got into doing what they do now and of course we'll be asking them for their advice to those that aspire to work with animals or for animals and the natural world. With that said, over to you Joe. Thanks Ollie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so today we're talking to two members of our uh, veterinary team here at Paint and Zoo. Um, the vet department may be small, but they are responsible for the health of every single tiny animal and massive animal here at the zoo, even down to all those invertebrates in Bugs at Home. So I've heard from them before that it's a little bit of uh, hands-on animal time, followed by a lot of paperwork. Um, but we'll get into that a bit more later on during the podcast. Um, now, being a vet or a vet nurse is something that a lot of young people aspire to. Indeed, it was something I really, really wanted to do myself. Um, for most of my childhood. So this is a great chance to get the inside scoop on um, this popular career choice and find out what it really takes to get into the industry. So with that in mind, I'll hand back to Ollie for our usual starting point. Okay, so we start every podcast with, of course, who you are and what you do. So we'll go around with, we'll start with Kelly. So who are um, you and what do you do, Kelly? Okay, so I'm Kelly and I'm the vet nurse here at the zoo. I've worked here for 20 years and obviously, like I say, I help the vets out looking after all the animals, mm -hmm. watching anaesthetics, helping to do treatment with animals, preventative health and all different things, which obviously I can talk more about as you ask me more questions. No, of <laughs> yeah. course, not a problem. And Rebecca, so who are you and what do you do? I am Rebecca. I'm one of the veterinary officers um i uh obviously look after the animals so that's medication sometimes surgeries we also talk about behavior and nutrition mm -hmm. uh but as joe rightly pointed out also a lot of paperwork so imports and exports mm -hmm. um welfare audits um we also do a little bit of research when we get the chance so just obviously making sure that we're doing the best job we can uh so a very varied position Excellent awesome. stuff. And then our follow-up question to that is, what is the weirdest job you've ever had? Oh, it's going to be interesting it, with I was you going to say. I bet you, because probably in just went straight in. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say. Did you have a job pre-veterinary nursing? So any job throughout your career history, anything particularly stand out as a bit strange? Sorry, really? vet veterinary career? <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be. Oh, because no, I worked anything. in a shoe shop for old ladies. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Why was it for old ladies in particular? Well, they were just like old lady shoes. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, lots of, uh, you don't realise, uh, I was a teenager and you don't realise that legs can get dandruff too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> but no, not really weird jobs. I mean, I did a paper round, but I wouldn't say that was a weird job. I suppose um, in the context yeah. of the podcast, yeah. once you've decided that this is the career you want to get into, that's what you're doing from yeah. now on in. And uh, yeah, yeah, apart from Saturday jobs I did before uni, this was it the whole way through. Yes, okay. that's true for you guys. Yeah. But then I think a lot of the other people we've spoken to, quite a few people have come to come to things later. Yeah. So yeah. they've yeah. shuffled their way through Done all different a things. glorious selection of jobs before <laughs> yeah. making it into into the um, zoo industry. So Trolley collecting at Morrison's, but I guess <laughs> that's not weird either. But yeah, just to obviously get myself through university, yeah. <laughs> cost-wise. What about weird things in your jobs? Not necessarily <laughs> the veterinary side of things, but any weird like things happen while you were maybe collecting trolleys or shoe <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's Things plenty. left over in the trolley. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did you go around stealing the pound coins when they had those? Definitely, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Collect them so now I can use them now. <laughs> I used to like the names of the shoes. Some yeah. of them had really stupid names. Like there were just loads of old men's shoes in various shades of brown, but it was always like seahorse or <laughs> captain's beard. <laughs> or just like all the different ways you could say brown. I enjoyed that quite a lot. I don't like Brilliant. paint colours, isn't it? You have yeah, yeah. millions of shades of white. It's just yeah. white. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, so we tend to start the podcast with you know how you've got to this point. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be opposite ends of the spectrum for you, Peg. Obviously, Kelly, you've worked here for many, many yeah, years. 20 years. Um, whereas, Rebecca, <laughs> obviously, you're quite new. Um, so I'm guessing it'll be a complete opposite in terms of how you got to where you are as well. Because I'm right in saying um, vet is quite academic in training, isn't it? Whereas vet it nurse is. is more vocational. Yeah. I don't know that it should be, to be honest, because I actually think being a vet is a vocational career mm. Mm. and that your hands-on skills... Yeah, um, interpersonal skills are certainly the things that I use the most day to day. Oh, okay. And that actually vet schools selecting for academia is mm. not necessarily 
gonna yield the best vets in practice. Having said that, there's a huge amount to cover uh, from your basic anatomy right through your pharmacokinetics, statistics and epidemiology. There is a lot to cover. So yes, you do also need to have mm. the academic abilities as well. Mm. Um, but it's it's probably quite difficult to get someone who's got the perfect mix, which makes it quite yeah. a tough job. <laughs> I had a lot of big words. I was going to say, what yeah, yeah. Yeah. is pharmacokinetics? <laughs> I've never heard that word <laughs> ever. It's like how drugs work once they're inside you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that makes sense, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with you, Rebecca, then. So what has led you up to this point? Uh, I always wanted to do it ever since I was wee. Uh, I, think I, I think my parents have a home video from when I was four. Uh, claiming that I was going to travel the world and be a veterinary surgeon. Okay. Um, I'm halfway there. I'm a veterinary surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I always wanted to do it. Um, zoo, well, wildlife vet specifically. Yeah. Um, zoos and wildlife, uh, they're not technically the same thing, but they overlap a lot. Mm -hmm. And in terms of getting the right sort of experience to take it out into the wider world, a zoo is a great place to go. Um, so this this has been the ultimate aim for... Yeah more years than I would like to admit now it's 30 <laughs> um, but uh yeah uh it's it's a long old slog you obviously have to get into vet school and that alone uh is incredibly mm -hmm. uh, challenging it's very competitive uh, and then you have to sort of tailor your um experience and uh the jobs you take and uh all of that sort of thing to to get you to here it's a different path to people who've maybe in the in been in the industry for even 10 or 15 years longer mm. than me um, you know, a lot of the people that were my mentors at that stage yeah. um, kind of fell into it a little bit. Okay. Uh, it was one of those where, oh, they worked in mixed practice. They were the only people prepared to see all the pet budgies. And now they run a zoo. <laughs> yeah, they do exotics, um, yeah. Whereas now it's a, a much more structured thing. There are residences, there are certificates and diplomas that mm. you can do. Uh, it is a bit harder to get into, but it is also becoming a more... Uh, respected discipline, uh, you know, where zoo vets are really at, at the forefront of a lot of medicines and things. Um, whereas before it was sort of a bit of a, oh, I'll have a go, see yeah. how, it, how it turns out type situation. So that's really exciting. But the, the pathway is, is long and convoluted. God, and how long? How long did it actually take you to uh, train then? I spent eight years in higher education. So I have two undergraduate degrees and a master's degree. Um, obviously the five years at vet school. Yeah. Um, and I have been qualified for 10 years this year. Um, obviously then with the five years previous at university of gaining my experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. from the point at which I decided that this was definitely going to happen, 17 years. Wow. In the <laughs> yeah. <'cause> wow. Mine's <laughs> well, not that long. <laughs> no. Okay. Let's go. Go on then, Kelly. Yeah. How long how's it take? How long does so it take? obviously I basically went, left school, obviously wanting to work with animals. I actually wanted to do work with cows basically on a farm because I was brought up on a farm when I was younger so I really enjoyed milking the cows and helping do that with my mm -hmm. dad and so I basically thought let's get a basis of animal care which basically led me to do a BTEC animal care in um, at De Montfort University and then I did a national diploma so it's three years in total at De Montfort University which basically gave me the baseline science A level to actually get on the nurses course and I was really lucky because when I did my national diploma, I had to do some work experience. Um, and basically two places I went to was a small animal practice um, in Nottingham. And I also went to a farm as well. So I did a bit of both things that I really wanted to do. And luckily, I obviously must have done a good job at the practice because they basically said to me, when you finish your course, if you'd like to come back and find out if there's a place available to do the training. So I got into it that way because I've worked in the practice, which was really, really helpful. Um, and then obviously when I did the course at uh, Priory, it was a three year course, sort of residential a bit, partly throughout. And then um, a weekly sort of going off to do the course at college. Okay. Um, so that's basically how I got the qualification. I worked there for another year. So basically in total, I was there for about five years. And then how I got this job was somebody obviously sadly wasn't very well they had back problems here one of the nurses and they said it was a six-month contract okay. so I thought brilliant 
best way of getting into exotics because obviously mm. at the time when I wanted to work with farm an animals, there wasn't a huge amount of work going on in Nottingham. So the opportunity to work more with exotics was came up and obviously I jumped at it. I didn't know anybody down here, no family, nothing. And I just went, I've got to go for it because I really yeah. want to yeah. work with exotics. So it was, you know, foot in the door sort of thing. So, yeah, so I took the opportunity. Absolutely loved it. It was amazing. Just even coming down to this area yeah. just to yeah. actually see where it was. I'd never been. A member of family had been here before, but I, you know, didn't know anything about the place. So yeah, it was really, really cool to come down. Just even just for the interview experience was great. Um, obviously, lovely sunny weather when I came down, which was perfect <laughs> for this area. Can't yeah, exactly. Always promised that. I was but... sunbathing in between coming here for the interview, nice. and then obviously, yeah. So yeah, so really, really good. And yeah, luckily I got the job six months, obviously, and then sadly the other nurse couldn't she came back for a while but then went off again and they offered me a full-time job so yeah. and that's how i've been here 20 years <laughs> and was that just keeping an eye open for all of the opportunities that were kind of out there yeah basically just obviously when at the time when i was trying to obviously find out what i was doing whether i was going to stay mm -hmm. or not i looked into small animal practices in the area as well yeah. to obviously go to them if I didn't get the contract. Um, and But luckily, the last minute, sort of, I've been to a few interviews. They said, obviously, you can stay for full time. So Amazing. It was awesome. really, really good, yeah. So cool. if people wanted to get into vet nursing now, is it, it's, it's still the same? So you, you, you do the training whilst you work? Yeah, it's slightly changed since um, I did it because I obviously did a like a day release sort of thing to the yeah. college, but they can do like a residential course as well now where they actually mm. go away and they do the course and then obviously then do some um, experience in a practice as well. Um, so it has it has slightly changed. Yeah. yeah so since when I did it. <laughs> cool. OK. It's not all about qualifications. I mean, you've already touched on it a little bit, Rebecca, about what other skills do you think a vet requires on top of all that academia? Uh, oh, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. And uh, Kelly will probably uh, <laughs> pick up on the ones that I miss. So, for example, <laughs> you know, like I say, universities select their vets to be um, uh, very sort of high achieving academically and everything. But, but crucially, there is a rigorous interview process because you do also need to have good communication skills yeah. and personal yeah. skills you are working depending on which area of veterinary you go into you are working with the general public all the time yeah. a lot of the general public will have strong opinions on things they are obviously very invested in their pets or mm -hmm. their farm animals their livelihoods so difficult conversations and that that's a skill that's infinitely more useful than uh passing your exams i would have said um also just having a, a good attitude to work it's hard work and especially when you first yes. qualify the sorts of jobs that you're going to be getting you will be working long days yeah. and probably nights yeah. for six to seven days a week it's tough so the understanding that expectation before you start is probably sensible i would like to say that you need to be clear-headed and organized i am not <laughs> uh, which <laughs> is where laughing. kelly comes in <laughs> Very organized. Um, we have a, a, a condition in the vet center that we call um, doing a vet look where <laughs> a vet asks where something is because we couldn't find it and the nurse just points at it because yeah. it was worse there all than a man look? I think it's worse than, <laughs> worse a, man than a man look. look. I'm assuming that a man vet is like doubly bad maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's funny though because when we can't find something we normally say oh I've done a vet look <laughs> so it's not a nurse look it's a vet look yeah. definitely behind every great vet yes. so yeah. organised vet nurse yeah. at Is least that? one yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah those sorts of things I think um, speaking of the vet nurse relationship as well uh, that is crucial um, there's no point coming into any working space as a, as a vet uh, whether it's a zoo or a practice uh, or a farmer at one environment and considering that you are anything other than yeah. a member of the team uh, yeah. you're all in this together there's no hierarchies there's no superiorities um, amongst the vet teams or there shouldn't be and that's really important because uh, none of us could do the job without each other yeah definitely mm -hmm. anything Rebecca's not mentioned then that you think is necessary maybe something <laughs> nurse specific <laughs> oh, I don't know I think you've got to be quite robust obviously because you know there is some Obviously, sad times when obviously you have to make the decision that an animal has to be sort of euthanized. So I think you've mm. got to be quite strong and minded to be able to take that. You know, it doesn't ho hopefully happen that often, but when it does, you obviously have to cope with that. Yeah. And obviously, if you deal with it quite a lot, you know, 
yeah, you've got to have coping mechanisms to deal with it. Um, and probably just being a really good listener, because obviously you get a lot of people having their own opinion, which is great. Obviously, I think everyone's got to have their own opinion. So you've got to like, take other people's ideas on board as well. You know, not always what you're doing is going to work. So somebody might have done it before that works better. So it's it's always a good good to be able to listen to people and obviously take their ideas on. Not always think you know exactly what you're doing. So yeah, I think that's quite and helpful. Excel. Yes. And Excel. And Excel. <laughs> yeah. Lots There's a surprising <laughs> amount of spreadsheets. That are <laughs> There's a lot of spreadsheets. Yeah. Vets or yes. keepers. Everybody's mentioned Excel in some way. Yeah. 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 Never yeah. ending. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, Kelly, you just touched on it there. So burnout is something that's quite big within the vet industry or mm. compassion fatigue mm. is sometimes called as well. What do you guys do to combat that? That's difficult. And I think it depends on the industry that you're in. Kelly's right, robustness and mm. coming up with some sort of coping mechanism. Um, but it's a balancing act because you, you can't let everything get you every yeah. time. Yeah. But you can't close it off completely, otherwise you stop caring yeah. completely, and then and then and then you're not you're not good at your job if you don't care. But you can't care too much, and it is difficult. And I think that's a huge part of why burnout is so common uh, in this industry. I think as well because as as we mentioned, it's a lot of work. It's a difficult, stressful, busy job with long hours. There's not much of you left at the end of the day. So yeah. finding the strength to to create those boundaries and maintain them can be quite difficult. Um, usually, um, the types of people that get into this work happen to be either by coincidence or selectivity, but pretty outgoing people. Kelly and I play water polo, yeah, which together. is uh, enjoyably violent, okay. yes. which does, <laughs> yeah. does a lot for relieving some stresses, yeah. um, yeah. which always goes down well. Yeah. But yeah, having having a life outside of work, it's easy when you are so committed to a career like this to throw yourself body and soul into it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great and it's admirable, but don't sell your soul for it because yeah. you'll need that later. Yeah. Um, and making sure that you have a friendship group outside of work, hobbies outside of work, um, safe spaces where you can chat about work without it compromising your professional co yeah. integrity. I think that's that would be my advice to anybody because it's it's tough. Definitely, yeah. What about you, other than violent water polo? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rounders. <laughs> I mean, rounders as well. Rounders as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Straight after the water polo on the Wednesday. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, obviously my family. I've got two girls, so obviously going home to them and obviously enjoying what they're doing at the moment and obviously getting involved everything they're doing at school and yeah. everything really helps um so yeah really just knowing that i'm going home to a nice family obviously and just putting the day behind you sort of thing or trying to and then obviously then come back in for another fun day <laughs> <laughs> reset yeah. and start yes, again yeah, exactly okay <laughs> has there been a defining moment in your career when you've stopped and thought wow my job's just awesome <sighs> i probably thinking about this i think when i i did some training with the gorillas, obviously hand injection training, which basically mm -hmm. involves obviously getting them ready to have an injection of an anesthetic before they have their full GA. And just being involved in doing that training was amazing. Just the achievement of actually being able to uh, and give an animal a pre-anesthetic injection and make them calm, relaxed before the anesthetic was absolutely brilliant. Just all the work involved in that and to know that not many people get a chance to do that. Yeah. It's just really, really brilliant. Yeah, that's probably my bit that I really enjoyed yeah. and made me think, yeah, like I say, not many people get to do this job. So, yeah. You do quite a bit of training then, don't you? Because like the gorillas can do pretty yeah, much anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do, obviously, the keepers do most of the work, obviously. Um, but yeah, I get involved or try to get involved as much as possible because like I say, it's a great achievement to work as a team to be able to help the animals out and, and treat them in whatever way you need to with the training. Um, so yeah, I've done quite a lot of training with the gorillas, orangutans, rhinos I've done a little bit with. So yeah, it's really good. That's what I mostly jo enjoy about this job. So yeah. Amazing. What about you, Rebecca? That's quite a difficult question. I find that almost on a daily basis since I started working in a zoo, I sort of have to take a step back and say, this is awesome. Even when I'm doing all of that paperwork and all of those spreadsheets, um, 
Kelly and I share an office and we mm. um, we have a great view of the zoo and sometimes you hear the lion roaring and mm. I have to just think, yeah. oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there's there's all sorts. It is, it's easy actually, that's an easy question to answer when you work with awesome species. But also if you did work with dogs and cats and things, you know, I remember doing cool surgeries. I put a blood vessel back together once. Mm. That was wow. cool. <laughs> and it, and it worked. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'll give it a try, and it was a it was a last chance saloon type thing, and the little doggy just trotted right out again, and you think, oh, wow, that was cool. Amazing. <laughs> I fixed that. I yeah. fixed that. <laughs> that good. So, is Peyton, Peyton's not the first zoo you've worked at. Is it? Have you worked? No, I have worked at other zoos, um, more in either research or training capacities. This is the first zoo that has fully employed me, <laughs> uh, but I have bounced around um, a few a few different zoos, and I've worked abroad quite a lot as well. Um, actually, yeah, that's probably the answer to the original question. I worked in India doing um, uh, radio tracking for the tigers. We were doing um, oh, wow. uh, ecology studies, uh, uh, population surveillance, yeah. and they obviously need vets because they have to anesthetize the animals to be able to fit the radio collars. And um, it's cool. You dart it and it goes to sleep. And you put, but the coolest thing was going out at night with the little beep, 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 beep. And then... Um, <laughs> And it's going beep, 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 beep. And it gets closer and closer oh. and it's dead dark and you can't see anything and your lights are off and you're whispering going, I think it's nearly here. That was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. So cool. <laughs> that just sounds terrifying. It, it was <laughs> terrifying. It was terrifying. <laughs> Is it true they make them wear masks so they've got eyes on the back of their head? I have loads of kids asking me that all the time. <laughs> no, no, I've never had to not, do not that. Not the tigers, like the people. No. <laughs> I can see how it would work, though. Because yeah, they're like weeping angels, aren't they, from Doctor Who? Oh, like, they are. If, they, they, if you they, look at them, they stop. Yeah. Mm, but then if you look away, then yeah. they go again. Our lion here, he's, he's hilarious for that, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, the tigers do yeah. that. Yeah. Tigers um, all the, I have a lot of fun where you. I film behind me. So, like... If you turn around and like crouch down as if you tie your shoe, but then keep a camera on behind you, you can see them yeah. sneaking up. Yeah. Yeah. It's brilliant. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying. This podcast is brought to you by Wild Planet Trust, a conservation charity based in the southwest of the UK with zoos in Paynton and Newquay, local and national nature reserves, and field projects in the UK, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, and Sulawesi. You can find out more on our website, www wildplanettrust.org.uk oh, Okay. Sorry oh, to on. interrupt. Um, so, as, well, you know, Joe, I've just come back from a holiday to an amazing place, Svalbard, Ooh, Arctic lovely. Circle, polar bears. <laughs> nice. Absolutely Wonderful. amazing. Did you actually see polar bears? I didn't see any polar bears. I saw the ones that were in the museums, so the taxidermy ones. <laughs> I was going to oh, say, what, cool. live ones um, in a museum? Yeah, live ones in the museum. <laughs> um, no, they weren't posed like that. They were posed more naturally oh, on all fours good, kind yeah. of thing. So they weren't like scary. But they give you the information of really kind of unique, like this is where it was. This is why it was yeah, killed and things like that. So it's kind of like... We shot it because it ate a yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. it's kind of... Up there, they've got the policy where you don't shoot to kill mm. unless you absolutely have to within like a certain range. That's when you're allowed to. And even then you get fined and deported from the island. Mm. I think that's what one of the guides told me. Um, but another thing that they told me, and um, which I thought I'd get a vet's perspective on, is <laughs> if there's one spotted near town, and this comes into like tracking and whatnot and darting them so they go to sleep, they dart the bears, obviously tag them, mm -hmm. and then they fly them off in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. To a safer area. To a safer area. Yeah. Because yeah. the idea is you don't want them close to town because obviously that poses yeah. a risk to people. Yeah. Right now, though, I'm literally Im imagining a polar bear dangling beneath the. <laughs> yeah. They do, they do the same thing yeah. with the rhinoceroses as yeah. well. So, yeah. Because they don't fit oh, in the so helicopter, they put them in a the helicopter. Sleep. Sleep. But are they in asleep? My... They're asleep, aren't they? They're not like. They start Whoa! off asleep. Yeah. They're, <laughs> they're asleep or half asleep. But I'm just thinking, like, obviously. The back of a helicopter can be pretty big. I don't know how big theirs are, but are they just strapped underneath? And is, is that, like, yeah. what's that yeah. procedure? And, like, what's the likelihood of them waking up and. Well, we get out you they're flying. usually have pretty reliable. I mean, most of the injectables you're looking at 45 minutes to yeah, an hour. Yeah. Okay, so um, enough time so to enough time to do it. Yeah, so they're scheduled. Well, where I would going, imagine. Yeah. I again, I have only moved things for much much shorter distances. Mm. You know, in the parks and stuff. But you would you would 
it probably takes a good hour, 45 minutes to hook them up in the rig and you yeah. then top them up with a whole nother lot again. Yeah. It is risky yeah. because you're not monitoring. Obviously, when we do that sort of thing here, you, you have someone constantly monitoring yeah. temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, that sort of thing, which yeah. you can't do once they're under the helicopter. <laughs> under helicopter. Um, but that 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 is kind of the only way to do it. And we can't have them awake because obviously from no. a welfare yeah. point of view, that's terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> but oftentimes what we found, certainly with the Tigers, was by the time you arrive at, their dest at your destination, you, you sort of plan as though once you arrive, the animal will no longer be asleep. Okay. So you, you make it so that there's no requirement for you to go back in with that animal yeah. Yeah. once the door is shut. At, <laughs> before you leave yeah. because yeah. if it does wake up it's not like you can do anything about it so you've no. got to then be in a position to just open the doors open and let it go, and let go yeah. amazing yeah, it's i cool. just wanted a vet's <laughs> perspective because i heard that and i was absolutely no, amazed real. like yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously you want to do that because they're well endangered so you don't want to hurt them but at the same time like just really yeah. Yeah. wake up wow <laughs> That's awesome. yeah. amazing just see these bears uh, flying along yeah sorry to derail derail your question at the get-go no, carry no, on all right. it, it ties over with the tigers <laughs> we're talking about anyway um okay so i chose not to pursue a veterinary career because quite frankly i couldn't be bothered um <laughs> because it was you know i was sort of Long hours 15 <laughs> 16 and i thought oh, i just can't be bothered to put the work in and do the work experience that's required etc cetera, etc cetera. So what advice have you got for young people who are approaching that point? And how do you make them say, no, stick with it, it's worth it? I think, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it is worth it. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that in the wrong way, but work-life balance in this industry is difficult. really difficult. Yeah. And okay. Obviously, I appreciate that at 15, 16, there is a heck of a lot more to distract you and put you off your, your sort of your work. But ultimately, it's not unreasonable to, to recognize in yourself that actually some things cost more than you're prepared to pay. And if you genuinely think at that stage in your life that it's that you don't want to do it, it's not going to get any better. It's not like it's only hard until you get there and then it's fine. It will yeah. be hard forever. So if if you if you're not if you don't fancy that, then that's legit. Then it probably isn't the career for you. The good thing is there's so many things that you can do that will offer you a lot of the same possibilities that make it an attractive job. If you love animals and you want to help them and you want to be able to work in conservation or just touch them a lot and cuddle them or <laughs> you're super into science and, and that side of things. There are other things you can do that will not cost quite as much energy. Mm. Um, so that doesn't mean that you've, you've failed and you might as well give up and do something completely different. You just have to look at it a little bit laterally because um, it, it is hard work and it never stops being hard work. Yeah. Is it true? So this is another one, the reason why I didn't do it. Is it true that you have exams every six weeks and if you fail, you get kicked off the course? <laughs> no, is that's that, not true. <laughs> is that, is that that's one of those weird I think someone just really didn't want you to do it, Joe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which vet did you have? I did zoology <laughs> instead because, like you say, I, I was like, no, you know what? I'm not. You I'm have not end of module it. exams, and yeah. I guess the, exa the modules are about six weeks long, but if you fail, you just take it again. Okay. <laughs> it's not. There um, we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, once you make it to second or third year, They've invested so much in you and you've invested, they won't let you fail. They will drag yeah. you kicking and screaming to the end of the course. Um, a lot of people drop out in the first and second years, but once yeah. you hit third, they're taking you with them, whether you like it or not, <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. So you'll get there. Obviously, you might reach the end so battered and bruised that you decide not to bother anyway, but, you know, with the career after all, but... Um, no, you, you won't you won't fail. <laughs> you can race it. It's not GCSE. You can just keep trying Amazing. until you get it right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know who told me that. It was your best friend. There was only one place left on the course. Yeah, and she you know, told you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit different, obviously, with vet nursing. I mean, you still have to work quite hard. But I suppose yeah. with you, you're starting at sort of 17, 18 in a job, a, a job you, so. I had a job yeah lined up but obviously trying to get into a practice I think that's mm. very difficult now mm. like to obviously get a job in them and especially in zoos once you're qualified as well it's really difficult because a lot of the jobs are maternity cover for mm. nurses so 
that's mostly what they're advertised for maternity cover so it is very hard it's quite high competition to actually get into it um i think the other thing to obviously this is not like sort of positive thing to get into it but it's you've got to think you may not be like a lot of people think you're going to get into this career and you're going to be cuddling animals all the time but obviously in the exotics you don't get to cuddle you know most of the time they're anesthetized yeah you know before you could get (laughs) anywhere near them and then obviously when you are near them you're obviously monitoring the anesthetic i think i get a lot of people saying oh do you get to touch the animals and and it's like yes but under anesthetic it's not like you're stroking them um and also as rebecca mentioned money wise i think you've got to be very a lot of people think you know you've got to sort of say oh you're not going to get paid a huge amount obviously in the veterinary side of things obviously you might go off into a specialist side and then you mm. obviously get paid more but with the nursing obviously it isn't good pay but obviously if you really do love to be able to look yeah. after animals and want to do the best for them then it is a good career to go into but yeah. i think you've got to be realistic that you are not going to be sadly cuddling <laughs> the lions tigers all the time um yeah. so yeah um and i think it's like i say you just a lot of the jobs we do in the zoo, some of them are just amazing. And like I said, as I said before, you, you know, there's not many people who are going to get to actually do these jobs. So I think you've got to keep going and obviously do the uh, course and everything and obviously see what you like, you know, get into the exotic side and see whether you actually like doing it. Um, but it is, as Rebecca said, a really hard job mm. and tiring, you know. But there is a lot of rewards in it as well. So, yeah. Oh, so... Obviously, when I've been working with you on different videos and stuff, and this goes to the cuddling the animals. Like, yeah. Don't worry, I haven't cuddled any <laughs> of the animals under <laughs> anaesthetic. I'm recording the procedure. But I did notice on, the, I think it was when we did a Kawati GA, you found that you were a bit sniffly around the Kawatis. Oh, yeah. So I... maybe it's the case <laughs> yeah. that sometimes you don't realise, but you could be allergic to the exotic animals as You're well. Yes, what are you to allergic this, yes. to? <laughs> I'm allergic to a lot of things. Sadly, I... Well, obviously started working here and it wasn't till about five years into mm. the job. I suddenly started having problems with goats. <laughs> and obviously they were okay. quite young at the time and I've actually got pictures of them actually climb, standing on my shoulders yeah. quite close when they were really young. Um, and yeah, so I started obviously getting reaction to them. I also did a bongo um, anaesthetic and basically I had a quite a bad reaction to one of those which was a bit sad because I really like the bongos um and obviously I went and had tests done and they came back with like all different animal fur that I'm allergic to so that can obviously happen which is quite sad my doctor did advise me to obviously stop the career (laughs) and that was there because obviously try antihistamines and everything like that but obviously you've got the side effects of making you sleepy and stuff like that so you have to be very careful with that um so yeah so the doctor did say i think you need to change career and obviously at that point i was like no way i've got here (laughs) it took me a long time to get here and i'm staying so yeah so i just obviously Uh, obviously like say wear protection and stuff to help didn't realize it was that bad yeah i did notice uh, that you were a bit sniffly around certain animals yeah i get problems with parrots sometimes as well but like i say i cope with it by just wearing masks ppe and stuff like that so that's something that you don't realize until you're in that situation and by then it's Like no. in your case, a bit too yeah, late. Yeah, a bit too <laughs> late, yeah. So normally in small animal practice, as I say, no problems whatsoever, rabbits, yeah. stuff like that. But yeah. obviously now it obviously occurs. But I think, like I say, you could obviously hopefully find out if you're in small animal practice before going and maybe into a zoo environment. Because obviously there's all different species in the zoo environment. Um, but yeah, you can normally find out beforehand, hopefully. Mm. <laughs> it's probably um, not going to stop yeah. you by the time you've got no, to No, exactly. No, Definitely I'm horribly not. squeamish yeah. and I was like, nope. I'm doing it anyway. Yeah, yeah. You're squeamish. You're squeamish and you're a vet. It's all no, it's awful. Because <laughs> um, like J- Jelaine, okay. who's the head of vets, I've been as a keeper. I've been in surgeries with her. When I've gone, what are you doing? Because she literally likes squeezing everything, doesn't she? <laughs> so you you're not a squeezer. It's, oh, I love a, I love a, I love a pimple. Oh, blood. So, I don't oh, cope well with blood at all. <laughs> even <laughs> even a little needle stick and I'm out cold. Yeah. But you'll happily chop into an animal Not for happily. surgery. Oh no, it's taken me years. Really? Yeah, yeah. I took a spleen out once and um I just handed it to the nurse and then just decked it. <laughs> Yeah. It's all right. Um, Rebecca's just sitting down there. She's all right. She's fine. (laughs) These guys are really, really nice about it as well because it's always like I'm making such a big deal, like a tiny little needle stick, and I just sit on the floor and yell for help because I can't deal with it myself because I can't look at the blood. (laughs) Squeamish vet. Okay. And one who's (laughs) allergic to animals. (laughs) We're doing great. We're a great team. (laughs) 
It's brilliant. Amazing. That's it's brilliant. I don't think we're going to top that. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in which case, I'm going to go to one of my last questions. So if you if you weren't working in the vet industry, what do you think you would be doing? Mermaid. <laughs> be yeah. a mermaid yeah one of those professional mermaids that does kids parties and oh that. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. yeah yeah there's a couple of them down in cornwall and they i followed them on instagram but it just looks like <laughs> a great, great way to make money <laughs> no, I've, I've got a friend i work with on weekends when i teach film and tv who is a professional disney princess yeah yeah something so like in that the same vein as that I, yeah i know many professional disney yeah. princesses actually do you? you do yeah. i know a lot of them mm. yeah and people who teach mermaid classes well so. she's definitely a mermaid when she's playing war polo but definitely <laughs> so yeah <laughs> you don't you don't wear a tail do you so you can no, maybe I'll go faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, go on, they can. i well i was hoping to be a football player because i really enjoyed playing football yeah. when i was mm. younger literally right up to actually go into the uh, university to do the animal care and forest did actually not team forest did actually ask me if i wanted to start training with them at the time it was obviously quite expensive to do um but now i do wish in some capacity that i yeah. did actually do it because yeah. like i say it's really come off you know girls football and i still enjoy it now obviously being the age i am i'm still <laughs> playing football but struggling obviously to keep up with everyone um but yeah no i think i probably would have gone into some sort of sport i think instead okay. of the animals so yeah yeah really enjoyed football like obsessed <laughs> um but yeah awesome nice i've realized i haven't done my favorite animals to work with and i do want to go back to that because i know rebecca's is a frog and i want to know why it's a frog (laughs) i've never had a chance to ask you i like the frogs because they're such an unusual challenge medically their skin absorbs stuff that touches it so so many drugs don't work or you could overdose them by just putting them near it um, they are obviously technically cold blooded, but you can get frogs that can thermoregulate. You've obviously got your tropical frogs, you've got your poisonous frogs. Um, yeah, I just think amphibians are, are fascinating. Uh, and they're just dead cute with their fat little hands and their <laughs> derpy little faces. I just think they're lush. Excellent Latin names. <laughs> and they have great <laughs> Latin names. Some of them are really funny. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Okay. okay. Hmm. And um, yours is yours is varied, isn't it? Yeah, it's varied. I obviously I really like elephants. Obviously, sadly we've not got them here anymore at the zoo, but I really enjoyed working with them. But probably gorillas are like the yeah. best, just yeah. because of all the training that I've done with them, and they're just so intelligent and their characters are just amazing. Just their faces they give, you know, what they do and stuff yeah. and move around and yeah, so I really enjoy working with them. So yeah. Do you have a favourite gorilla? probably Pertinax because I've done oh. the most work oh, okay. and I do like him Pertinax yeah. is our old boy yeah, 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 yeah. Old boy. do you have yeah. a favourite joke mm-hmm. being a of primate course. keeper of course Kiondo he used to be okay. Kivu until he turned into a teenager. Then he didn't. I don't like him anymore. Yeah. So much. Okay. <laughs> now Kiondo, <laughs> mainly because he's the only one that comes to say hello to me. Oh, uh, fair <laughs> enough. Go on then, Ollie. Wrap us up. Okay, <laughs> so we end our podcast being careers focused with what is your advice to your fifteen-year-old self? I think about this a lot. Okay. Um. I don't think once I decided I knew what I wanted to do, any time machine owning future me would have been able to dissuade me okay. from my chosen path, which is sometimes a comfort because it, when it gets tough, I can at least say to myself that this was always what you wanted. Yeah. Sometimes that feels like a lot of pressure. Uh, and as Kelly has pointed out, um, the work life balance is pretty tough. Um, Sometimes it can be very emotionally draining and there will be dark days. Um, Remember the lions roaring and the tiger in the dark um, and the cool blood stitching thing. Um, You know, those those high points, uh, I think, are are worth it. But I think if I if I ever went back and talked to my 15 year old self or anybody asked me, I'd say, no matter how badly you want this, don't overlook your other needs in Mm. pursuit of it. Because there may come a time when you run out of steam and you'll need sensible coping mechanisms and yeah. a plan B or maybe a plan B. Um, uh, that would be my advice. Okay. Not super cheerful, but <laughs> that's what you asked for. And I, that's what I would say. Honest advice. I like it. Yeah. What about you, Kelly? I think just like say, if you are very keen to obviously get into animal, working with animals, then obviously 
keep going and trying and basically just get as much experience as you possibly can talk to a lot of people that have obviously done it already obviously listen to these sort of things as well and obviously hopefully that will guide you in the right way and and obviously like I say just keep trying if you've got a dream to do it then yeah give it a go but like Rebecca said always try and think of other things as well that you could obviously fall back on if it doesn't work out yeah. pan out right so yeah Okay. And obviously get to do these cool jobs that not many people get to do. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very cool job. Yeah. It is a cool despite, job. <laughs> despite how despite hard despite it can be. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It does sound very cool. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Excellent. Well, that is it for this episode of So You Want to Work in a Zoo. Thank you very much for joining us, Kelly and Rebecca. Thank you, thank you Joe. <laughs> thank you. Uh, anything else you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, no. In that case, that's a wrap. Thank you very much for joining okay. us and we will see you in the next one. Thank you so much for listening or watching our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us a review or if you're watching, please hit the like button and leave us a comment about your favourite part of the episode. To get more content from Wild Planet Trust, please consider checking out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there and you can also subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Of course, you can find Wild Planet Trust, Painton Zoo and Nuki Zoo on all main social media platforms. And we'd really appreciate you checking those out as well. All that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. And of course, we'll see you in the next episode.